All right, well, thank you, Serena, for the introduction. And of course, thank you to Squire and Marty uh, and Karsten for organizing this and inviting me to do the test case on nitrogenase. As I was thinking about you know, test case for nitrogenase, I looked back over the vast literature in nitrogenase. The enzyme was first started to uh, study really in the early 70s. And I now have maybe 2,000 papers in my database. And I thought, well, this isn't going to be possible to cover all of this. So what you're going to get is an edited version of nitrogenase as I see it and in the world that where I think I can uh, explain it and, and guide you to understand what, where we're at. So I've organized the, the presentation today into four segments. And we'll talk about what those are uh, when we get into this. And the first part, what I want to do is just introduce nitrogenase again and remind you you know, why do we care about nitrogenase? Why should we study it? Uh, and then set up what are the problems, these four problems that I want to go through. And then hopefully have plenty of time for discussion. And I, and I mentioned discussion rather than just question and answer. I'd really like to get a conversation going. There's many people in this room that think a lot about nitrogen reduction. And many of the students hopefully are thinking about this. And I'd like to get everybody involved in a conversation. So hopefully there'll be enough time to do that as well. So let's start, of course, with why we need nitrogen. I think everybody in this room knows that we have to have a fixed form of nitrogen to support life. It's essential for amino acids and proteins, for nucleic acids. And as you probably have seen many times, uh, and if you look in uh, microbiology books, you'll see some variation of this, the global nitrogen cycle. And as you appreciate that the element nitrogen can be in various oxidation states, more oxidized states, more reduced states on this side. And that this cycling of these different oxidation states of nitrogen will be called the global nitrogen cycle. And I'm going to put in a, a plug about part of this cycle here in just a second. So obviously this, this is the reaction we're going to be talking about right now, taking N2 from the atmosphere. This is the aerobic world, this is the anaerobic world, and reducing that to the form of ammonia, a fixed form of nitrogen. And that's essential, of course, uh, to, it's the biggest input, single input of fixed nitrogen into this uh, global cycle. But as you probably know, that this, this ammonia can be oxidized. There's a whole uh, suite of organisms, microorganisms, that live off of this. They can take ammonia, and this is called denitrification, and take it all the way back to nitrate. And then in the anaerobic world, there's a whole suite of organisms that do denitrification that can reduce, use this as a terminal electron acceptor, and reduce this back through these intermediates, ultimately ending back here in N2. And the plug I want to put in is that the enzymes that are involved in these processes uh, were discovered by many, including Peter Kronick. Uh, and these enzymes are really fascinating enzymes. They're almost all, I think they're all metalloenzymes, and I would say they're vastly understudied. So if you're a, a young scientist who's looking for a metalloenzyme that really is understudied, that's important, an important part of this cycle, I would say look at Peter Kronick's work and other people like Kyle Lancaster, where these enzymes, I think, are ripe for the kinds of interrogation with new tools, as Joanne was saying, that we have today that when Peter was working on these, they didn't exist. And so I think this is a really uh, big area. I'm going to focus on, of course, this reaction, uh, reduction of N2 to ammonia, either anaerobic or aerobic. And as you probably appreciate, there are really two ways that we do nitrogen reduction at scale. And one of these is through the Haber-Bosch process. This was an invention by German chemist uh, Fritz Haber won the Nobel Prize in 1918, and then it was perfected by this engineer, Carl Bosch. He won the Nobel Prize in 1931. And this has been an incredibly successful reaction. It's in the top five industrial processes worldwide, and about half of us in this room exist because of this reaction. Because the biological process, which we'll talk about in a second, wasn't keeping up with demand. And so what did Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch perfect? Well, they used an iron catalyst, and they could do this reaction of N2 plus hydrogens to make ammonia. This is an interesting reaction, a lot known about this, where the N2 is split first, and then we do the reduction of those nitrides. And this reaction um, was invented in the early 1900s, but didn't take off in, in terms of its exploitation until the 1950s. Well, what happened in the 1950s that allowed this to happen? Well, that's when fossil fuels became prevalently available to drive these reactions. So this reaction is so successful because it's driven by fossil fuels. Uh, that's because of the need for, for the heat, high temperatures, 500 degrees, the pressure, 200 atmospheres, and most importantly, the hydrogen. So this reaction uses hydrogen. That hydrogen today is made from the reformation of methane. So you can see that the footprint, carbon footprint of this reaction is massive. So somewhere on the order of 2% of the CO2 that's generated in the world today comes from this process. Uses about 1% to 2% of all the fossil fuel uh, in the world. 
What's interesting is it has a high energy demand. And I remember early on we were thinking about, well, nitrogenase doesn't have such a high energy demand. It turns out back of the envelope calculations suggest they're about the same. This is, of course, how uh, biology does N2 reduction, going back a couple billion years. We think it's a pretty ancient process. And that's through this enzyme called nitrogenase. And this is the reaction. We're going to come back and talk about that reaction quite a bit. That's the balance, the, the best stoichiometry for this chemical reaction. And there are several things to note about this, of course. One is this happens at room temperature and room pressure. So that's cool. You don't require all this heat and all this high pressure. It doesn't require H2. So this reaction uses protons and electrons. So it's really an electrochemical process. And that's something we'll maybe get some time to talk a little bit about using water. But it uses ATP. And for those of you that aren't biochemists, appreciate that that's a lot of ATP. 16 ATPs for every single N2 that's reduced. Turns out when you do that quick calculation, it's about 400 kilojoules of energy per mole of ammonia. You can see the comparison here. So our early thoughts about, well, nitrogenase is you know, more efficient, doesn't use energy like we do with the Haber-Bosch process is probably not correct. They both require a lot of energy. And that's going to be one of the things that I want to tell you about today is we've been trying to figure out how do we use that energy? Because if you could understand it, you might be able to substitute for it some other kind of renewable sources of energy. So that's what we're going to talk about is nitrogenase. Now, what do we know about nitrogenase? And we're going to skip forward a lot of decades. And this is sort of the, the current picture, the state of how we understand this enzyme looks. Of course, this comes from really the pioneering work of Doug Reese and his various colleagues in 1993, first solving the crystal structure of these proteins independently, and then more recently complexes. And there's been a whole series of structures that have really driven our understanding of this, including uh, from Oliver, who's sitting up here in the front, who's really made some seminal contributions into what this protein looks like. So I'm gonna walk through uh, sort of what we currently think is happening here, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges that were remaining, and that's what we're gonna focus on in the last four parts of the talk, is talking about what are those challenges. Okay, so it's composed of two proteins, nitrogenase is. This one's called the molybdenum iron protein, which you can see is an alpha beta, alpha beta tetramer. And that'll become important towards the end of the talk when we talk about uh, these two independent halves not being independent. That's a new discovery that we have. And then the iron protein, it was a dimer, it's an alpha alpha dimer, and that's where the ATP comes in. So the two ATPs, one bound on each side of this iron protein. And what happens is this iron protein docks to this MOFI protein. They're together for about 200 milliseconds. And during that 200 milliseconds, a whole cascade of events occur. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Ultimately ending with electron coming out of this iron sulfur cluster, which is in this iron protein, going through this P cluster and ending on this FEMO cofactor. And then we're going to collect those electrons on that FEMO cofactor along with protons. And that's where we're going to do the chemistry of N2 reduction. This protein then has to fall off. It gets recharged, it gets reduced, ATP, ADP exchange, and then it comes back on again. So you can see this really is a giant molecular machine. There's a lot of moving parts here. As this protein docks, all of these hap things happen in the 200 milliseconds, and then the two proteins come apart, and then you repeat that eight times. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about is several aspects of, of this mechanism. Now, a little bit about this. Um, we're not going to talk too much about more about this active site. Um, you can see this is an iron sulfur cluster. It's two bridged iron sulfur clusters with a molybdenum here. And of course, it has this organic cofactor, homocitrate, and then carbon in the middle. This is the contributions of Serena and Oliver, among others, who more recently, with higher resolution crystal structures, uh, showed that that was a carbon there. I think early on, a lot of people thought that maybe it was a nitrogen, but they validated now that it's a carbon. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that carbon and what role it might be playing in catalysis uh, and what, how it might be hemilabile, et cetera. Okay, so we'll come back and talk about that. I'm going to simplify this for the next first bit of this talk. The proteins in this way, so it's a little bit easier to walk through this as we go along. So this is now one half of the MOFI protein. You see with its P cluster, that's the P cluster and FIMOCO, and then here's the iron protein with its iron sulfur cluster and the two ATPs. And of course, they come together, dock, as I said. We get these, all these cascade of events, ultimately leading to reduction of substrate. Acetylene is a, is a surrogate substrate that we use often. OK, so here are the four questions that I want to address in the rest of the time. One is, why hydrogen? 
And some of you may have looked at this balanced chemical reaction and noticed that one hydrogen in this stoichiometry, stoichiometry that we show is formed for every one in two that's reduced. This was uh, early observations. We'll talk a little bit about how this was observed and then it was doubted. And there was a lot of doubt in some of even the key literature uh, from Thornley and Lowe, among others, that maybe that wasn't required. And so we're gonna try to address that problem. We think we have an answer for why hydrogen. We'll come back and talk about that. That's in what we call the, the molybdenum iron protein part of the cycle here. And then I wanna talk about the iron protein cycle, the energy requirement. I wanna address four, three different topics on this side. One is the order of electron transfer in ATP hydrolysis. And we'll show you that it's sort of maybe counterintuitive initially. It was the, turns out it's the opposite way around than the way I would have predicted it. Then we'll talk about the rate limiting step, revising what in the early literature showed was a rate limiting step. Turns out it's not the rate limiting step. We'll talk about how we did that. And then this idea of the two halves, which I already alluded to, aren't working independently. They're allosteric. And so as Joanne was talking about earlier, there's a strong allosteric uh, phenomenon going on here, and we don't understand why. And I'll speculate about some ideas about what we think it might be doing. Okay, so let me start by saying, by recognizing the folks uh, that, uh, that we're working with, uh, the contributions that I'll tell you about. Um, of course, the work that uh, we're doing has been a long time collaboration with uh, Brian Hoffman, who's already been introduced by Joanne. Uh, he's an incredible uh, EPR spectroscopy, indoor spectroscopy, but also just a really good, bright scientist. And I think that's great. As you say, we have multiple Skypes every day and he's just a lot of fun to work with. And then, of course, we've had a long-standing collaboration with Dennis Dean's group. He's really the microbiologist, molecular biologist in the group. We couldn't do any of this if we didn't have the bacteria making the appropriate proteins, et cetera, that make that happen. Some of the additional uh, work that I'll tell you about is I'll tell you about Edwin Anthony and his contributions in the ATP realm. He's now at Marquette University. He used to be one of my colleagues at Utah State. We'll come back and talk about that. We're doing some electrochemistry with Shelley Bentier's group at the University of Utah. We'll come back and talk about some of those. And then we have some new calculations that are going on. So this will be, as uh, Frank said, this will be the poetry part of the talk, right? The imagination part, creative part. And we'll talk about doing some uh, quantum mechanical calculations and how they might be able to take us from experimental observations to sort of view to the next level and then hopefully have testable hypotheses. I won't talk about uh, the nanoparticle work that we've been doing with this group down here. Uh, maybe during the discussion we can talk about how we can drive electrons in using other things like nanoparticles. The work that uh, is in, happening in my group is supported by the Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences. Okay, so let's get to this issue of hydrogen. You know, why does, why does nitrogenase uh, make hydrogen? Let me just maybe even go one slide ahead here and say that this goes back to the earliest studies on nitrogenase. And this was work that was done in Bob Burris's group in Madison. We were just in Madison last week for the iron sulfur cluster meeting, Steenbach meeting. And uh, that was of course where the headquarters, if you will, for nitrogenase uh, research for decades was in Madison, just down the road. What's that? He's still alive. He's not, he's passed away just recently. Yeah, now maybe five or six years ago now. Is that right, Judith? Yeah. So yeah, so he was, he was really the, the one who first showed with purified uh, and even in soybean root nodules, that hydrogen was in, in evolved as part of this mechanism, right? That's the idea. And then it was many years later that they did what I think is still the most definitive experiment on the topic in 1984, this appeared in science. The question was, could I put in enough N2 to suppress the hydrogen evolution? So what they did was they went to 50 atmospheres of N2, right? So this required a bomb to you know, build that pressure and be able to do that experiment. And what they found, was, and you can read this if you want, but the essence of it is it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, pretty close to that, so even at 50 atmospheres. And I think that was probably the most definitive experiment that said that the hydrogen evolution must be an integral part of the mechanism. It's not just a side reaction, it's not just some uh, adventitious reaction, it really is fundamental to the mechanism. But in those years after that, a lot of people, uh, experts in the field, us included, really started to doubt, well, why is the hydrogen uh, form. Why do you actually need that? Because it's wasteful, right? You're wasting four ATPs for that each hydrogen that has to come out. Uh, and so why would you need to do that? And we'll come back and talk about that. Okay, so now let's take, take up the story then with uh, 1985 with Thornley and Lowe through a whole series of kinetic studies. And you can look up all these papers. They must have had 30 or 40 papers where they 
elucidated what we call the Thornley and Lowe modified uh, MOFI protein uh, cycle, or the kinetic scheme here. And so let's walk our way through what they essentially show. Is we start from this E0 state, the resting state of the protein, and then we collect one electron, one proton at a time, and make an E1 state, an E2 state, E3 state, E4 state. And what they knew from these studies, and these are really heroic experiments, and they were able to deduce quite a lot from this, was that you have to accumulate electrons and protons on this active site, FIMOCO, before N2 will bind. Okay, so between three and four, it looks like uh, from their studies, you, you, they couldn't really distinguish. It looks like maybe both of these states could bind N2, but we'll focus on E4 state, and there's some reasons why we, we'll talk about that. So we have to accumulate these electrons and protons to get to this E4 state, and that's where we can bind N2. And then in the reduction phase, you can see we go through four, five, six, seven, and eight. You reduce that bound N2 and ultimately release both those ammonias, and now you start the cycle over again. So this is a nice kinetic cycle. There's great rate constants for many of these steps. But what we didn't have was we didn't have any intermediates for any of the steps. So they're just black boxes. What does E1 look like? No idea. What does E4 look like? No idea. And so one of the things that we started to do about 15 years ago, sort of classic biochemistry, is see if we could trap intermediates. Because if you can have an intermediate that you can interrogate, and you know where it is on this scale, you can start to understand, hopefully start to understand what the mechanism might be. And the truth of the matter is we trapped a lot of intermediates. We tried all kinds of rapid freeze quench, and we have EPR active states. And we could have really beautiful EPR spectra, and we could have trapped states, but we never could figure out where they were on this map. So basically, we had two worlds. We had this kinetic world with all these blank states, and then we have all these trapped states, and we can't figure out which ones are which. So we were basically stuck. And then uh, Brian had a really important breakthrough about how to deal with one of these intermediates that we had trapped. And it was one that we trapped during turnover with just hydrogen, making hydrogen. We weren't doing any N2 reduction, we're just trapping one of these states up here. And the critical thing that we discovered was when we trap them, we freeze trap in liquid nitrogen, right? So we take them down very cold and nothing's happening. And what he discovered was is if he does what's called the temperature step and needle experiment, where he brings the temperature up to like 250 Kelvin, it's a permissive temperature and that allows some reactions to happen, like hydrogen formation, but it doesn't allow more electrons to be added because it's still a frozen state. So I'm not moving forward, I just have the potential to move backwards. Right? I'm allowing things to relax. This is a really important experiment. It's a heroic experiment because, of course, what you do is you have to warm it up to 253, let's say, for just a second, and then you go back down to liquid nitrogen or liquid helium temperatures, make a measurement, and then you come back up, and then you go back, and you just keep repeating this, and you start to plot where are things at. And what we discovered was this one state that we had trapped, it turns out it was in a, a protein that we had altered an amino acid trying to slow down proton delivery. Turns out it mapped to this species right here. And how do we know that? The way we knew it was we could see this species relax in two steps, like you see here, and that there was an isotope effect that was consistent with us forming H2 in each of those steps. And I'm going to skip past all of the experiments that we did, but suffice to say, what we had done is we had trapped this state. And of course, if all the states that you have on that kinetic scheme that you'd want to trap, that'd be the first one you want to trap, because that's where the action's at. That's where you're going either backwards to release hydrogen or going forward and binding N2 and then going forward. So we had trapped the E4 state. And I remember I was telling uh, this to uh, a bunch of physicists. I got invited to a physicist uh, department and uh, physics department, and we, I was telling them about this. And somebody in the back of the room at this point raised their hand and said, hold on, you're telling me that you're putting electrons into this metal core at the same potential, and you're putting four of them in. They didn't buy it. Because there's no way that you could use the iron protein, which is at minus 400 millivolts like that, to put the four electrons into a metal core. I didn't have an answer at the time, but when we started to understand this E4 state, it suddenly became apparent what was going on. And so I already showed you that. Okay, so what's going on in this E4 state? And this just shows you what I told you, uh, that we were using freeze trapping and it was this state, and then we could monitor that state. 
And so I'm going to cut through a lot of spectroscopy. You'll need to invite Brian Hoffman to come and explain all the spectroscopy. That's his world. But I'll give you the punchline of what we discovered. And it was two significant discoveries. We made the isotopomers of the protein, iron 57 labeled, MO95 labeled, uh, cofactor, and then we analyzed this state that we had traveled, uh, trapped this E4 state by indoor and E-seam spectroscopy. And I can vividly remember the Skype call that Brian and I had, and he said, you're not going to believe this. You've trapped E4 state, but the metal core is at the same oxidation state as E0, is where we started. I was puzzled. I didn't make any sense. I know we put four electrons in there. I know we did. But you're telling me the oxidation state of the metal core is the same. And then a few weeks later, when he had finished the rest of the indoor experiment, using protons and deuterium doing this indoor, the answer became clear. And that was that these are stored as hydrides, as metal hydrides. And we were pretty confident now, based on model compounds uh, that, have been, that Brian has done, with Pat Holland, for example, that this is absolutely what it is. We have two bridging hydrides on Fimoco. I'm just representing Fimoco as this, this core here. It's representing this entire structure here. So that was the answer. So I got to call back up that physics department and say, I understand it finally. You know, you do put the electrons in at the same potential. And the reason is because Fimoco only ever accesses one redox couple, right? Because once you put an electron and a proton in, it forms a hydride. And then when you put the next one in, it forms a hydride. So it only ever uses that one couple. That's how biology got around the problem of accumulating multiple electrons in a metal core and not having super low potentials to be able to do it. We're pretty limited in biology and the potentials that we can use. So that was the sort of the eureka moment, Joanne, for us, was when we finally realized that, wow, this is about metal hydrides. And of course, we could have an, a long discussion about the whole suite of enzymes that are probably using metal hydrides, many of them are for sure, many more that probably are, like hydrogenase and methyl enzyme M reductase, et cetera, many enzymes that are using these hydrides. And so that was really the, the, the key moment for us was when we realized that we're storing these as metal hydrides. And we've done a lot of work on these hydrides that I won't tell you about. For example, we know that they're photolabile, so we can hit them with light and we can do like has been done with inorganic uh, model compounds. We can get these to reductively eliminate and make hydrogen, and et cetera. Okay, so we'll hopefully in the discussion we can talk more about that. Okay, so we've captured these metal hydrides. And so what did that tell us about mechanism? Well, it actually suggested a number of different ways that you might then be able to bind into and reduce it. And I had my favorite uh, mechanism, which involved uh, insertion into these hydrides by N2. Right? That would be an obvious thing to do. And so what I want to tell you about then is once we've formed these hydrides, and of course we've brought protons along, and the calculations suggest that they would appropriately go on that sulfur, but I don't know that anybody's ever seen those. Maybe Serena, you can help me here. I don't know that anybody's ever seen those hydrogen, those protons on the sulfurs, but that's where we all put them, the sort of placeholders. So take that with a grain of salt. That's a reasonable place to put them, but we, it may be fictitious. It may not be there. They may be on the protein nearby, et cetera. Okay. So we have these hydrides. And of course, one thing that can happen with these hydrides is if they terminalize, they become more reactive, and they can react with this proton, and you could get the formation of hydrogen, right? That's what we think is going on in these relaxation steps, is the hydrides become reactive enough that they react with these protons, and you get this formation of this hydrogen as this relaxes back. But the other thing we want to talk about a little bit is this, what happens if these two hydrides combine in a reductive elimination, and now we might be able to get a mechanism for N2 activation. And that's what we've been working pretty hard at, trying to understand if that's uh, applicable in nitrogenase. But first let me tell you about exploring this reactivity of these hydrides as this falls back to make hydrogen. And so this is a reasonable hypothesis, right? That may be how the enzyme relaxes. We know that if there's no N2 present, this enzyme is a hydrogenase. It'll make hydrogen just fine. Uh, at a big expense, of course, much more expensive than hydrogenase is, because it's doing this at the expense of ATP. But you can see that it's quite happy to relax. These hydrides react with these protons, and this can relax back and make hydrogen. The question is, could we start to understand that mechanism better? And the problem with this whole thing, and I didn't mention this up front, but I'll mention it now, is the overall rate limiting step for this enzyme is on the other side of the house. It's over on the iron protein ATP side. 
And so anything that we try to do with isotopes or kinetic studies are always reflecting the rate limiting step on the other side of the house. And so it really limits the ability of us to do, understand or start to do isotope effects, for example, on this chemistry, because we can't really ever see it. So what we needed was a way to deliver electrons to this cofactor and to this protein that didn't involve the iron protein and ATP. And if we could do that, now that could open a door for us to start to understand the reactivity of these hydrides and reacting with protons. And the breakthrough there came when we started to work with Shelley Mentier's group at the University of Utah. And what her postdoc, uh, Ross Milton, figured out, this is how the nitrogenase normally works, just to remind you, here's the one half of the MOFI protein, P cluster if you moco, and here's the iron protein binds, of course, electrons go in, we do this repeated, requires ATP hydrolysis. This is the rate limiting step in the overall reaction. But if we could figure out how to deliver the electrons to the MOFI protein directly from an electrode, for example, and in this case we're mediating this with uh, cobaltocene, if we could do that, we could eliminate this part of the reaction, this rate limiting step, and so that we could start to unveil a new rate limiting step, which is the formation of hydrogen, right? And this shows you that it works. Uh, you can see this is the Texas Convention Electrochemistry. This is current density versus the applied potential. And you can see that these are the various controls. This is the important one that you want to look at in red here. This is the MOFI protein with cobaltocene as a mediator. And you can see at about, you know, minus a volt or thereabouts that we can get onset of uh, hydrogen evolution and we can get pretty strong. This is a catalytic current here. We can get pretty strong hydrogen uh, evolution going. So we got electrons into the MOFI protein without the iron protein and ATP. So we took away the rate limiting step. That allows us now to unmask this rate limiting step, whatever it is, in hydrogen formation. So what Nimesh and my group did was he did a pretty clever experiment. He took that electrode that had that immobilized MOFI protein on it and he just basically put it in buffer with different percentages of D2O. Right? And what's nice about this is you don't have to make a new electrode each time you do the experiments. You don't have the variability between electrodes. You just take the same electrode and just move it from one solution to the next, to the next, to the next, and then do your CV. And what you can see is quite nice. Now this is in the IUPAC convention, so we switched the other way around. This is negative potentials. This is a negative current, a fl current flowing this way. And so you can see here it is under hydrogen. Here it is under 25% D2O, 50, 75. And so you can see there's a nice isotope effect here, which we could never see before, because of course the iron protein was masking all that with all of its slow chemistry and ATP hydrolysis. And what he did was he plotted this, these ratio of this current versus the fraction of D2O in what's called a proton inventory. And this is fairly, this is new to me, Joanne, you already knew this, is that if this is linear, it tells you a great deal about the transition state of this reaction. It tells you that there's one H involved in the transition state, not two. If it's more than one, then this curves significantly. It can be quite either direction. It can curve quite significantly. But the fact that we repeated this many times, it's linear. This proton inventory told us that there's one H involved in the rate limiting step, right? So I scratch my head. Okay, what could that be? because you have the, you're, we think you're combining this hydride with this proton, and my first guess was wrong. I thought it was the lysis of the, the hydride iron bond. It turns out that's not what it was. We don't think based on calculations. So this is now where we turn to the, the fantasy or the poetry of the reaction. Bounded by that experimental observation, could we use calculations to start to make predictions of what that transition state might look like. And this is where Simone and his colleagues at PNNL come in and they did these calculations without the protein environment. So that's another caveat here. This is just on FIMOCO. And of course we start from this hydride, bridging hydride state with the proton. This is the E2 state. It's simpler to do the calculation. It also relaxes to make hydrogen. And of course we know that we do this. And so what does that transition state look like? And so based on these calculations, this is what he says the transition state should look like. You notice that the iron hydride bond hasn't changed much, and that's what's showing here. You notice here it is 1.6, 1.61. That iron hydride bond hasn't changed at the transition state, but the bond distance between the sulfur and the proton, 1.37, 1.8, that's where that bond is lysing is we're breaking the sulfur proton bond 
and forming that proton hydride. You're getting protonolysis here of that hydride and forming the H2. That's what the calculations predict. It makes sense. And it's reverse around from what I predicted. I lost that beard on that bet. Okay, so what might it look like? So this is again, this is a movie picture that's fiction, right? But it's a reasonable, uh, I think a reasonable expectation. This is showing you starting from the hydrogen the proton bound to that sulfur and what it goes to the transition state as you start to form that HH bond and you break that sulfur proton. So it's testable, so we're trying to figure out if that's indeed the fact, but we think this is uh, the first time we've really seen how nitrogenase does some of its chemistry. In this case, it's the easy chemistry. It's the chemistry of making hydrogen. Okay, so that's that part of the story. So let's now talk about what about this E4 state and what about N2 binding? What does that have to do with binding N2 and activating N2 and that really difficult reaction? Well, we considered a lot of different potential mechanisms for how that hydride might be used uh, to reduce N2 in that first key step. And what we had to do, though, was we had to test all of our predictions against 50 years of experiments. And these were uh, brilliant experiments that were done by people like Barbara Burgess, a name I think many of you know, and Bill Orm Johnson, among, among others, including uh, Bob Burris. And what they created was a whole slew of what we call factoids, that's meant in a positive way, facts about this enzyme that you had to test every model against, right? And so these are some of the key factoids or facts that we had to test against. As I already told you that N2 only binds to the E3 or E4 state, that there's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry if you believe that Burris 50 atmosphere experiment between N2 bound and hydrogen evolved. The other key things, and these were things that were sort of tucked into the literature that nobody really paid much attention to until you start to think about this more, is that it's only when you get to this state that you can react H2, or in this case they use D2, and you can reload this with deuterium. Right? So there's a reversibility is what the prediction was in this equilibrium right here. And in particular, if you load this with the deuterides, we knew that you could make HD. So you could grab a proton and this could relax back and you could make HD, but only if D2 was present and N2 was present. And the other one was, this was again a very heroic experiment using T2 gas. Nobody in this room wants to do this experiment, right? This is, uses the whole university supply of tritium gas or tritium, right, on the whole campus. And what they did was, this was Barbara Burgess, is they put T2 in place, and what they found was that that T, when it's loaded in here, didn't exchange with the solvent. That's consistent with hydrides. You don't expect these hydrides to, to exchange with the solvent. You would expect a proton to exchange with solvent, but not the hydrides. So when we tested all the different models, including my favorite one, which didn't win out, uh, against this, what we came up with was this model that I show you here. And that is reductive elimination. And this is well known in, in inorganic literature, is these two hydrides combine to make H2, and now you've set up a scenario where N2 could bind. And we've done a lot of experiments to try to uh, exploit this and try to understand this, but probably the most critical experiment we did was an insight that came from Dennis Dean. And the insight that we had at a Gordon conference was the following. This is Dennis Dean down here. Many of you know him. Was he was sitting there looking at this, okay, you guys are saying this is, uh, this is the likely mechanism, and we had shown already that uh, this was pretty reversible. You already knew it was reversible from the early studies where you could put in H2, and you could push this back and load this back up here. And we showed that this was reversible by changing concentrations of H2 and N2. We could push it back and forth across this equilibrium that we could trap. But his, his thought was this, if this is true, then what you ought to be able to do is put in D2 and N2 and load this with deuterides, okay, so we can make HD. We already knew we could do that. But could you intercept those deuterides with the non-physiological substrate acetylene, which had been known since the 60s that that was a, could be reduced by nitrogenase? But in this case, if the mechanism that we're talking about is true, if we could intercept this intermediate, we would make deuterated ethylenes. It's the only way that you can imagine that nitrogenase can make deuterated ethylenes. There's no other way, no other mechanism. The only way you can imagine that is if this equilibrium could be pushed back by putting in D2, which would, of course, then validate the entire reductive elimination mechanism for existence, that existence of that state. And so a postdoc in my group um, 
Zhang Yang actually did this really uh, difficult experiment where he put in three gases, and you have to vary all three gases to get the concentrations just right, D2, N2, and acetylene. And what he did was he actually started from C13 acetylene so that we could get away from the natural abundance of C13, which is pretty high at 1.1%. So we just go right to C13 acetylene, N2, and hydrogen, or deuterium. And then here's just a representative mass spec trace of the gases that come out at the end. You can see that if we're looking at, uh, if we do this with H2, and this is looking at mass overcharge of 31, which is what you'd expect it to be, uh, you're looking for if you deuterated this, and then here's the deuterated example of this off the GC trays. And so he did a time dependence of this, and you can see that it worked. And so here's a time dependent formation of the mass overcharge gas product M over Z31, and you can see here's the monodeuterated formation of the monodeuterated ethylene coming up. Here's your controls, leaving out different things, showing that it basically doesn't change. And so this validated that you could actually intercept that intermediate with acetylene. And further, at much lower yield, obviously, we could see the dideuterated as well. And it makes sense that you'd get a lot less of that than you would of the monodeuterated, but nonetheless, it, we saw that as well. So it really validated this mechanism, this idea, this concept of reductive elimination at that critical E4 step, that you could go back and forth between those states. So what that left us with is, is a really crude reaction coordinate that would look something like this. We have the two hydrides. You notice that we're being a little fast and loose how we draw the hydrides here. We don't have a strong sense for how those hydrides look. Maybe in the conversation and the discussion, Oliver will jump in here. I think he's got some ideas on how that might look and we could talk about how spectroscopy could be used to test that, et cetera. But this is, take this just as two bridging hydrides, you know exactly where they're at uh, is still up in the air. Reductive elimination, start to form hydrogen, the N2 binds to that state, and then you end up with a, a state of nitrogen uh, that is the first electrons reduced. And I think it's important to sort of pause and think about this for a second as, as we did. I told you that this is a pretty reversible process, right? And it turns out that we've measured that equilibrium constant, and it's pretty close to one. It's within the error of our measurements, it's pretty close to one. Just to remind everybody that in the gas phase, this is uphill by like, 50 kilojoules per mole, something like 100 kilojoules per mole. It's way uphill. And so this catalyst has done what you'd expect any good catalyst to do, and certainly what all of us enzymologists expect, is it's flattened the reaction coordinate, right? By stabilizing intermediates, it's flattened this reaction coordinate so that we don't have to achieve 100 kilojoules of energy uphill to get to that first activated state. So that's what the enzyme does. The magic of how it does that we don't understand, but that looks like it's some variation of what I show you here. Okay, so now again, we come back to the poetry part of this. We turn to calculations, and Simone has been uh, doing uh, really difficult calculations, doing the full quantum mechanical calculations of Fumoco with molecular mechanics, including uh, all of the protein, but in the quantum mechanical calculations, using all the protein that's surrounding and all the waters that are surrounding. So this is really difficult calculations. And a couple of things that he found that are worth noting there's, there's been many people that have done uh, DFT calculations on Fimoco. Uh, most of them don't include all of the protein. And many of those studies find that as you start to add electrons and protons into Fimoco, the protein blows, uh, sorry, the Fimoco blows apart. And in particular, I'm thinking of Per Sigmon has a paper that came out fairly recently where he is accumulating uh, electrons and protons. And what he does is he puts the, the electrons and protons go on to the carbide in the middle. And that carbide actually comes out as a CH3 and he's proposing that's part of the mechanism. And we could reproduce that finding if we left out a big part of the protein. But if we include all of the protein in the quantum mechanical calculation, that's hugely uphill to put those electrons onto that carbide. Matter of fact, we never see a change in the iron carbide bond distances as we load four electrons in. Instead, what we see, and, and this, Oliver, you'll want to see this, because this is in line with what you're, you're seeing as well in your structures, is a labile sulfide, right? So that's what's hemilabile here, is that sulfide pops off and allows us now to make the H2. This is not a true transition state, this is a trajectory, so this is, again, make-believe, but it is reasonable. And then we have these states over here that we really can't distinguish in this level of theory, but they're all variations of N2 binding. So that's interesting along the lines of what you've seen with the vanadium structure, we'll have some time to talk about that. Uh, this idea of a hemilabile sulfur, not the carbide in the middle, 
like many people have thought, including ourselves and Per Sigmund sees in his calculations, instead it seems to be a hemi sulfur, and I don't know, I actually don't remember which sulfur it is, if it's the same one that you're seeing in the vanadium nitrogen, so we can maybe sit and talk about that. Okay, so this is what we think this could look like. Again, you notice it's a pretty flat reaction coordinate, uh, fairly low energies here to go between these, again, what we expect based on the fact that this is a reversible, an entirely reversible uh, process. Okay, so again, might as well have a movie. So this is the movie of what uh, Simone has generated. He calls it a computational tail. I think the tail is the essential part of this, right? So I take it with a grain of salt. So what we're doing here is we're, here's our two bridging hydrides. We go to the hydrogen form, and then we're gonna go to the N2 bound state. He's mapped this onto the structure. Here is our bridging hydride. Here's a proton, and here's N2 that's gonna come in. And so you can see we start to form H2 from the proton and the hydride, the two, sorry, the two hydrides. Here comes N2 in. We think the N2, of course, has to bind before the hydrogen's released, otherwise we can get into a lot of details. It, it, it violates some of the earlier observations. So here we are now in the H2 bound state. Here comes N2 in. It's gonna bind at the same time before the H2 is released. There's the N2 bound. Here it happens to be bound bridging and now hydrogen is gonna be released as H2. So you can see that the essential need for hydrogen to be evolved is part of the mechanism. And in fact, from thermodynamic calculations, we can convince ourselves that unless hydrogen's evolved, you can't even bind N2. You, can't, you don't have sufficient energy. Okay, so where we stand in terms of thinking about the mechanism of N2 activation, some of the takeaways that we have so far is that as we accumulate electrons and protons, uh, it makes sense that you're gonna accumulate those as hydrides. And a matter of fact, this E1 state, we now have uh, preliminary data that says that it's actually a hydride as we showed it here. It could have been that you reduced the cluster and didn't form a hydride, but in this case, it looks like you oxidized the cluster because the preponderance is that you wanna go to make a hydride. And so you're gonna accumulate electrons and protons as, as uh, hydrides. You notice again, we only use one redox couple here. It's always the same and we just keep accumulating hydrides. We've been talking quite a lot about uh, this state here, the so-called E4 state, and I think we have pretty solid evidence now of the requirement for productive elimination of these hydrides for N2 to bind, the reversibility of that process in an oxidative addition, and then the formation of some species here, which we don't uh, know yet. We don't have a spectroscopic handle on that uh, state yet. Maybe Oliver does in that state that you've trapped uh, with the NH. No, maybe, yeah, maybe it could be what it is, or maybe it's a later state, that's another possibility. And then what you imagine, again, this is all make-believe down here, but reasonable is how would you deal with that N2 that's bound, and here we're using migratory insertion, it's sort of the obvious thing you do, and you can walk your way through here, and you can release an ammonia, release another ammonia, and out you come with your two ammonias. And this is all, I think, pretty reasonable chemistry. We have trapped a state uh, that's consistent with E7 and E8, but have not characterize those very well. It does look like they're an NH2 or an NH3 species. And I think maybe that's what you have, Oliver, is E E7 state, is that what you're saying? Six or seven. seven. Yes, yeah, six being here, six or seven. So again, I think we're starting to build evidence for the, the last part of, of this um, mechanism as well. But obviously that's a frontier area. A lot more research needs to happen there as well. We're trying to elucidate these hydride uh, states as well. Okay, so that's the first uh, little piece about this. Now the last uh, three pieces, these will go faster. And that has to do now with thinking about the energy side of things. Over here on the iron protein side, the need for all this ATP. And what I wanna address are these three topics here, the order of electron transfer and ATP hydrolysis, the rate limiting step in this 300 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds these proteins are together, and then this idea of negative cooperativity. And again, I wanna set this in the, the frame of some early studies. And again, we come back to Bob Burris. Uh, this is, notice this is 1962. This, I was two years old when this uh, paper came out. Totally unaware of this work. Right? <laughs> that, that ATP was required for nitrogen fixation. This was done in cell-free extracts. And then shortly after that, uh, Lynn Mortensen in 1964 uh, communicated, this paper communicated by Burris showed that ferrodoxin and ATP were required in this reaction. 
And by the way, uh, Lynn Mortensen passed away about nine months ago, so he was a real legend in the, in the field along with uh, Burris. Okay, so going back to the earliest studies, we know that we need energy to do this reaction. We need ATP. And then, so then from jump forward through all the studies of uh, Thornley and Lowe, we come up with a kinetic scheme that looks like this. And this was really, a, like I said, a heroic effort that they were, came up with this. And let's walk through this. This iron protein docks to the Mophi protein, one half of it here. It's very fast. We get electron transfer. There's two electron transfer events. This one from the iron protein to the P cluster, then from the P cluster to FIMOCO. And we get ATP hydrolysis slash electron transfer at 140 per second. We can't resolve those, and we'll talk about how we've gone about resolving those. But at this stage, in these early studies, these were unresolved, the order of those events. And then phosphate release, you get hydrolysis happens, you get phosphate release. That race constant was measured pretty accurately at 16 per second. And then the two proteins come apart at, with a rate constant of 6 per second in the overall rate limiting step. I told you earlier that this iron protein cycle was where the rate limiting step is. It's right here. It's in this uh, release experiment. So we've been trying to fill in some of the gaps that existed in this model. It's a great framework to start from, but we've been trying to fill in some of the details here over the last several years. Now I just will show you some of the things that we've been addressing, and we'll talk more about this one. It turns out electron transfer happens before ATP hydrolysis. This was a surprise to me, and I think to many in the field, because I, like many people, have said, well, ATP hydrolysis is being used to drive electron transfer. Mm -mm. It's the other way around. The electron transfer happens first, and then the ATP hydrolysis. We'll talk about how we resolve that and what the significance of that is in terms of understanding the mechanism. The other was uh, this electron transfer. Uh, I think many in the field, myself included, said, well, this electron transfer goes from here to here first, and then it goes from here to here. Turns out we have, I would say, modestly strong evidence, not terribly strong, that this actually follows a deficit spending electron transfer. This electron transfer happens first, followed by a backfill from this one. We won't have time, maybe in the discussion we can talk more about that. And then we also have measured uh, this electron transfer, this one in particular, and can show that that's conformationally gated. It's a pretty large conformational change on the order of 800 Square angstroms is our estimate based on osmotic pressure effects on the rates of electron transfer. That's a gated electron transfer process, and we won't talk more about that here. I do want to talk about the rate limiting step. As I showed you earlier in the Thornley and Lowe model, the rate limiting step is dissociation. Turns out that's an artifact from using dithionide as the reductant. When you use the real reductant, which was a challenging experiment, I'll show you that the rate limiting step is not the dissociation, but in fact, it's the phosphate release step. And then the last thing we will talk more about is this idea of negative cooperativity. There's another half over here that I'm not showing you. The two halves don't work independently. There's a pretty strong uh, allosteria between the two halves. Okay, so this is our revised model, just to show you the, the punchline, and then we'll work through this. So this is our revised model, proteins dock fast. This is the first and gated electron transfer. This is a follow-up electron transfer. This is our hypothesis. We now know that electron transfer happens first and then ATP hydrolysis. And I've given away the rate constants here. We'll come back to these. And then phosphate release. And then this step is actually quite fast. So this is the overall rate limiting step. All right, so let's work through how do we sort out some of these, uh, these unknowns in this mechanism. First to the order of electron transfer versus ATP hydrolysis. So what's the problem? Why, did it, why couldn't we resolve this order of these events? Well, it turns out measuring the electron transfer rate constant is pretty easy. This requires a stop flow spectrometer. You shoot the proteins together with ATP. And then what you can monitor is the reduction, uh, the redu as the iron protein loses its electron as you oxidize that iron sulfur cluster it has a pretty diagnostic increase in its extinction coefficient at 430 nanometers. And so here you can see, this is 20 milliseconds. You can see that pretty easy to, you can repeat this. This is our data. This was first done by Thornley and Lowe. You can repeat this many times and you can really monitor electron transfer with high accuracy, right? That's not a problem. We can do that. But what about the ATP hydrolysis? Turns out that's not that easy to do on these timescales. And we were perplexed by this for the longest time. We couldn't figure this out.
And then I had a colleague who joined us who came from another world, and this is of course the power of collaborations, as Joanne was saying, somebody who came with a different skill set and a whole different way of thinking. He came from the world of ATP utilizing enzymes, and I pitched this problem to him, and he goes, oh yeah, we can make that measurement. He didn't tell me it was easy, so he didn't lie. Turns out it was actually pretty difficult, and the way we did the measurement is like this. It's a double mixing experiment in a quench flow instrument. So you use radio-labeled ATP, iron protein, mophi protein, in this syringe. You mix those with different delta times, and then you quench. And then you develop that material on a TLC, so real TL, old school TLC. And you can separate the ATP from the ADP, and then you can quantify the formation of ADP and the loss of ATP, or mostly the formation of ADP. So you can see that that experiment took I think a postdoc and a graduate student, a full year of, of repeating it over and trying to figure this out. How do we do this? And in the end of the day, they get a data set that looks essentially like this one. This is again, you know, time in milliseconds. This is the formation of ADP. And you can fit this quite nicely uh, to a first order rate constant. And you can see that you get a rate constant of uh, 70 per second. Those of you that were remembering the numbers will remember that the electron transfer rate constant was 140 per second. This isn't even close. This is happening after electron transfer. There's no doubt about it. And so we can plot these, again, this is time on a log scale versus percent maximum. You can plot these all on the same graph. And you can see here's electron transfer at 140. Here's ATP hydrolysis at 70. Here's phosphate release at 16. And then this is uh, where we would have dissociation based on the old model. So you can see it's very clear the order of events. It wasn't equivocal. It wasn't even close. It's first electron transfer, then it's ATP hydrolysis. So ATP hydrolysis is not being used to drive the electron transfer. It's being used to reset the system at the end. And it turns out that in a, I'll just jump past that. In an old paper that came from David Baratan, many of you know David Baratan down at Duke University. This is back in 2001. He made some predictions on this. Uh, based simply on simple calculations. And let's sort of walk through what, this is a figure out of his paper, let's walk through what he showed. This is the iron protein, this is the donor, this is the Mophi protein, the acceptor, and you energize the donor for electron transfer by the association, desolvation, and distortion, right? So it makes sense, the iron protein binds to the Mophi protein, you energize the electron transfer from the energy of that association, ATP binding included in that. You now have that energy is harvested by the electron transfer, so now we get charge transfer from the iron protein to the Mophi protein, and that energy is compensated for by making a tight complex. Essentially, you make a complex that can't come apart. So how are you gonna get the proteins apart? Because you have to recycle at the end, and of course what he said was you repay that energy by ATP hydrolysis by a distortion and dissociation of the proteins. It turns out that's consistent with a whole swath of ATP utilizing enzymes, transporters, et cetera, is this idea that the ATP hydrolysis energy pays back at the end, not at the beginning. So this put nitrogenase in line, uh, rather than being out of line, it put it in line with a whole swath of these ATP utilizing enzymes, and it turns out Baratam was, is right in his concept, going back all the way 17 years ago. Okay, so that's the issue of the order of ATP hydrolysis, order of ATP uh, electron transfer, we now know that order, I think that's pretty clear and it makes good sense of how it'd be that way. Now what about this issue of the rate limiting step? Protein-protein dissociation, that's what was found. And the experiment, this actually shows an oscilloscope's trace from Thornley and Lowe, I found this in one of their papers. That's how they used to collect their data was they'd take a picture, right, with a camera of an oscilloscope's trace as they were watching the dissociation of these proteins. What were they watching? Well, as the proteins come apart, this protein, which is in, has this iron sulfur cluster in the oxidized state, becomes accessible to a reductant dithionite, right? We all, I think everybody here knows dithionite, we all work with dithionite. It's great reagent because you just buy it from Sigma, Aldrich, and you can just weigh it out, and it's a fantastic reductant. We pretty much bathe in it, we, all, we have it everywhere because it's an oxygen scrubber for us, right? So it's everywhere. All these studies were done with dithionite. The key piece here is dithionite won't reduce this cluster in the complex, it only reduces once this protein comes off. And you can see then, when you measure this, here's the oscilloscope trace, you can see you can watch the reduction of that cluster. It goes from oxidized to the reduced state, right? It's great. They can do the measurement, 
and they have a kinetic scheme that can fit this two, and they get a rate constant of five per second, which is consistent with the overall rate limiting step in this reaction, right? It all makes sense. But there was one thing that they sort of hinted at that they, I guess, glossed over, and that is that dithionate, of course, there's an equilibrium between dithionate, sodium dithionate is what we use, and the true reductant here. And the rate constant for that reaction is about two per second, and uh, you can see that it has a KD that's really low, right? So Squire, you asked that question last week, now you can see the answer. I had it up there, I didn't mention it at the iron sulfur cluster meeting, 1.5 nanomole, right? So oh, I think you all see the problem here, right? The reductant that you're using to reduce this is really slow to be formed, right? There's very low amounts of it and it's slow to be formed. And it's got a rate constant that's about the same as the rate constant you measured here. That's a little bit problematic. All right, so how do we address this? Well, it turns out dithionates, this is gonna surprise you, is not the reductant inside the cell, all right? <laughs> the cell never figured out how to use dithionate. So what does the cell use to reduce this? Well, it's pretty clear from kinetic, uh, uh, genetic studies that it uses either ferrodoxin or flavodoxin. They can be used interchangeably. And so we embarked on trying to do this experiment with flavodoxin. And so what we did was we uh, purified a lot of flavodoxin. Uh, of course, that's a flavin containing protein. We already saw that. And we can make the hydroquinone form of this. And it turns out Xiong uh, is using this flavodoxin as a reagent, just like we use dithionite. And so the students in the group are going, uh-oh, that sounds like a lot of work. And it turns out it was, he purified 10 grams of flavodoxin, right? Turns out it's fairly easy to purify, yes, but still it's 10 grams. So we're using it as reagent millimolar concentrations, 10 millimolar for our, as our reagent. What he did was he did the same experiment, right? So the same one that Thornley and Lowe did. So this is, we know that flavodoxin won't reduce on complex, even though there was some papers in the literature. Uh, earlier we showed that wasn't the case. It only reduces it when this comes off. And here's dithionite. So we're doing the same thing. Now we don't have the oscilloscope anymore. We're doing this with a real stop flow. And you can see here's dithionate, rate constant about four per second in our hands. Now uses flavodoxin in the hydroquinone form. It's this blue trace, boom, super fast. It's faster than we can measure. We're estimating, you know, greater than 800 per second. Ah, so when you use the real reductant, not dithionite, suddenly this is not the rate limiting step. You have to go back one step. It's phosphate release. It's not this step of the dissociation of the two proteins, right? And so what we can now do is come back to the reformulated or updated version of this iron protein cycle. We've already walked through uh, this, but I'll just remind you of the things we just went through. We now know the order of electron transfer and ATP hydrolysis. We know this is the rate limiting step. Remember, there's two phosphates released here. So that's why that number is twice as big as what about we see for the overall number for the protein turnover. And then this is a fast step here. So this is our current uh, model. There's still a lot of things unknown about this. We don't know what stimulates this electron transfer. That's still a bit of an unknown. Uh, we, don't, we don't know, you know, how phosphate release is the rate limiting step. We don't understand the conformational changes that occur when phosphate release that allows the proteins to come apart that causes this. So many, many questions still exist, but I think we now have at least a, a different, a slightly refined frame of how the iron protein side of this cycle works. And now to the additional surprise, and again, this is for the students, this is where serendipity comes in, and don't listen to your advisor. <laughs> okay, so, as I told you, this protein, Mophi protein, has got two alpha, beta, alpha, beta. It's a tetramer, right? And it has an iron protein on this side, an iron protein on this side, and these two halves work independently, right? That's what the literature said. We had written that in reviews. Many people had written that. The two sides are working independently. But it always nagged me, as why would you make a protein that's like this, maybe it's just part of evolution, right? It was evolved from some other protein, but why would you have these two halves here and they would work independently? So the title is two catalytic sides working independently or maybe not, all right? So where does the maybe not come from? And this is where the students uh, started bringing me the data. And this was from those quench flow experiments. And this is showing you ATP hydrolysis. This again, this is, you know, 40, 60 milliseconds. ATP hydrolysis here. This is electron transfer, right, time in milliseconds. And what we expected, of course, is if the two sides were working independently, is that you should get four ATPs hydrolyzed in this initial time. And you can look at that data and you can say, it's not four, it isn't even close. And so 
What does the advisor tell the student? Go back and do it again, right? And do it again, and do it again, and keep doing it. And they kept bringing the data to me and it kept looking like that. So at some point, even I had to change my mind and say, well, maybe that's real. Maybe it really is not four, right? Why? And then they started bringing the electron transfer data. You'd expect two, right? One going from this side, one going from that side. See, it's not two. This is the, we worked pretty hard to get this scale just right. It's not. It's half, roughly half, a little bit more than half. So why is that? Well, long story short, it turns out the two sides are cooperating with each other through negative cooperativity. This side over here goes forward, and this side is all prime but waits. It's waiting for this side to complete, and then this side can go forward. At least we know that's true in the initial mixing of the proteins. Now, whether or not it becomes chaotic after that, I don't know. We can't really mo monitor those reactions after that, but certainly for the first couple of rounds, the data really is consistent with the two sides cooperating. And this is for Brian, this is a fit, uh, a global fit of this, this is the ATP uh, data. So here's the real data here, you can see the data. And we fit this to several different models. This is independent sites, and you don't have to follow all of the states here to, to get the idea of independent sites. The two sides are working independent. And you can see that here's two independent sites, that's what that data would fit like. Ah, not very good. This is half sites cooperativity. Joanne talked about that earlier. This is a concept, of course, that first came up, I think first came up with Koshland in the 70s uh, through a whole number of different enzymes now have been shown to have this half sites reactivity. This idea that one side goes, the other side waits, and then you go back and forth like this. And Koshland never, to my satisfaction, explained why. He just said that it happened. It, it, it really did happen. Well, here's half sites, fit the data, and you see it, it underfits the data. So instead, what we have is a model that I call the leaky model. It's a negative cooperativity. In other words, this side goes forward, but occasionally one electron slips through, and then this side can go forward. So it's a little bit leaky. So we call that half sites, uh, sorry, call that negative cooperativity to indicate that it's a bit, it's not a stringent one side than the other side. There's a small percentage of the time that uh, the other side leaks through and goes. Okay, so that's the, how we can fit the data. All right, so in, in essence, what's happening, we think, is something that looks like this, is that this side is primed and ready to go, this side's primed, and then this side starts, electron transfer seems to be, in our model, what controls this, then HB hydrolysis happens, and then this whole cycle can go forward, and this side is waiting. I put a yellow light here rather than a red light to indicate that there's you know, some leaking here. It's a yield sign, essentially, not a stop sign. But this side is waiting, right? So the obvious question is, why? Why do this? And how could you do this? And I think the how, we have some reasonable idea. And this again comes from some coarse grain calculations. And so these are not DFT calculations. These are just coarse grain ball and stick spring kind of calculations from Simone. And what he's looking at is one iron protein on, on, the, on one side and how it might uh, connect to the iron protein on the other side. This is about 130 angstroms across this. And what he found was a pretty strong anti-correlation between the motions on this side and on this side. And this is consistent with some really nice x-ray structures that were done in Doug's lab, lab where they showed that they were able to trap a couple of different states and there seems to be some sort of connectivity here across these. And so all of this started pointing to a mechanism for how you do this is you'd have this protein, you notice these are going, remember this is, a, this is a, a dimer symmetry. So this one, when it's moving this way, this one's moving in the opposite way. And you can see that this one, the electron goes, and then this one now can move in that direction and the electron can go. So what we're trying to do now is get finer and finer grain in our calculations to try to understand specifically uh, how do we connect between this side, the motions on this side, and the motions on that side. And what we're finding as we start to burrow down into this, is that there's some really interesting changes around the P cluster, which is right here, as part of this. So it looks like this might be sort of the magic that we've been trying to find that stimulates the electron transfer on this side. When that iron protein starts to rock across there, we stimulate that electron transfer. And then this side uh, is waiting. But it still doesn't answer the why, and I don't have a satisfactory why for you. Koshland never addressed the why, but there was a paper uh, that came out in science fairly recently, maybe some of you saw this, from uh, Proser and Pi's group, I don't know them, but it was in science 2017, working on fluoroacetate dehalogenase. And what they found in this fluoroacetate dehalogenase is uh, 
this half-sites cooperativity or half-sites reactivity. And what they speculate, and again, it's not totally satisfactory yet to me, but they speculate about why, how, not how, but why you might want to have this uh, negative cooperativity. And here's sort of two takeaway messages from this, is that one side can enforce changes that are enhancing the dynamics. In other words, dynamic conformational ensemble. And so those that think about me enzyme mechanism, this idea that you have an ensemble of, of conformational changes that are happening, that are guiding a reaction forward, that the one side could be sort of enhancing or focusing those, those dynamics on the one side. And then the other has to do with an entropy compensation. So as you're binding a substrate on one side, that's, that's against the entropy, right? That's going to be more organized. And the other side could release waters to compensate for that. So basically, you can imagine a compensation. It's a reasonable idea, not totally satisfactory yet to me, but nonetheless, it's what we have about how the two sides might be, why they might be cooperating. Obviously, a lot more work needs to go on to try to sort this out. We have some uh, studies going on where we're trying to sort this out by making a chimeric protein, right? Where you make one side, you can make mutation on the one side, not on the other side, and start to ask questions about how does that cooperativity, is it essential for a reaction? Is it essential for how the enzyme works? Okay, so let me just again summarize at this point, and we're gonna leave plenty of time for conversation and discussion. What we've been talking about, so there's a lot of unknowns here, but I think we uh, start to understand why this enzyme makes hydrogen. It's an integral part of the mechanism. You can't actually bind into unless hydrogen's formed. We now have resolved the order of electron transfer, putting nitrogenase in line with the whole swath of ATP utilizing enzymes where we pay that energy back at the end, not at the beginning. We now the rate limiting step now is, is not uh, dissociation, but it's actually phosphor release, which makes sense because that's what should dictate the two proteins coming apart. And then sort of the, the big mystery here now in this negative cooperativity. Why are these two sides cooperating? Something to do, obviously, with the energetics of the reaction. Uh, biology wouldn't have developed this just randomly. It, it really does have to be an integral part of the mechanism. But hopefully, we'll start to be able to elucidate that. And with that, I will stop and open the floor for discussion. Yep. Talk. For the for the three A five A the possible formation of the sulfides, um, it was a cartoon initially of Brian's, but it looks like at least the crystallography from Doug Reese's group, I guess, uh, together with the EPR, seems to at least mm -hmm. be consistent with the cartoon. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, I think there are two reasons that you can get curvature in these proton inventories. Mm -hmm. One is that you have multiple protons in flight. Right. The other is if you have a proton being transferred from a group with an unusual fractionation factor. Oh, okay. And it seems like if you guys agree that the protons on the sulfur, you have both in this case. Mm -hmm. Is it ever possible that those two effects cancel when you get a linear Whoa. plot Whoa. that's actually two moving, one from a group with an unusual fractionation factor? Boy, that would be a mischievous god for yes. sure, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I guess it's possible. I mean, I would turn to you and to Joanne to ask if that's even I, likely. Yeah, I so, enough about it, but yeah. The sulfur has the weird gravitation factor. So. Boy, it was pretty linear. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question, but I'll wait. Okay. Hey, Mike. Lance, in the, I'm sorry if I missed this, but in the cycle, the rate limiting step is Phosphate. That's right. ADP, ADP remains bound. It does. It looks like the ATP is bound even after the protein comes off, and then that exchange is separate. So how do you know that? And, and, the, and then the second part of the question is, it dissociates from the other protein, and uh, at that point, you reduce it, mm -hmm. and then there was this arrow that just said recharge. Recharge, yeah. <laughs> that's right. So what's happening there? Yeah. And that's when ADP dissociates and ATP yes. rebinds. Yeah, as, I mean, as you probably know, it's really hard to measure ADP, free ADP rapidly. We have some studies where we've done that, and it's pretty clear that the ADP is not released from the iron protein 
uh, before the iron protein comes off from the Bofi protein. That's why I have it still bound. Now the recharge, it looks like that's a two-step process, right? You're gonna reduce the iron sulfur cluster with flavidoxin or ferrodoxin, and then there's an exchange of the ADP for the ATP. We've measured those affinity, those, those KDs for ADP and ATP and the reduced versus oxidized, that whole combination, right? And it's consistent with that order of events where the ADP stays there until you reduce the iron sulfur cluster, then its affinity lowers and then you get the exchange. It's relatively slow, but it's, it's happening separate from the cycle, right? So you've got infinite amount of, infinite, a, a lot of excess of iron pretty. So that's happening out there in the rest of the, the cell, and then it's coming back. So you just have an excess of iron protein. There's one in the back of the room, and then we'll Sure. Uh, so Lance, this is yes. not a huge question. This is somebody who hasn't been reading enough for 50 years in this okay. field. So catch me out from the road. Remember Barbara's stuff with the two electron reducible uh, form of the iron protein. And so, does it make any difference if, say, for example, you could transfer two electrons within a molecular vibration, or mm. what's happening with that? And does it matter? That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if it matters or not. I mean, you're absolutely right. I and mean, there was a lot of uh, actually started with Gary Watt who showed that the iron protein could, it normally has a two plus, one plus couple, but you could actually reduce it to an all ferrous, a zero state for the iron sulfur cluster. And he actually showed some data that suggested that you could get two electrons, you know, transferred. And then, and you said Barbara also did that. We've not been able to reproduce that in a kinetic experiment. We can certainly reduce that iron protein to the all fair state. We've been able to do that with a really strong reductant, a reductant that's more, uh, more negative than the cell has. And so I think, I think there's, you know, that's still an open question. Um, I, don't know, I don't have a strong sense about that. Yeah. I'm very really fascinated by the experiment where you get rid of the uh, nucleotide binding subunit and just can derive the nitrogenase by the electrodes. Because of yes. all the mechanisms that you need, and you can follow this and right. information and change. So, how could you explain that you could with the, just with a large overpotential drive? Without all these conformational changes, you're just supposed to, to drive it. Yeah, good question. And, and this we struggle with this every day. And I'll, and I'll answer it by saying, that was a bit of sleight of hand on our part there because we were only looking at hydrogen evolution, right? <laughs> right? We, were not, we cannot drive into reduction. There is a new paper that just came out um, a couple weeks ago from Shelley Mentier's group where they are claiming into reduction, but the rates are 2,000 times lower than the iron protein driven reaction. So I think it, as she would agree with this too. There's still something we're missing. It, over potential is insufficient. It isn't sufficient to overcome that, and so we have not been able to do into reduction at reasonable rates yet. Okay, and then I have a second short question, because I will give you an awesome talk. I actually Googled the PED if there's any structure from thermobacterial hexoleptoses. Oh. Because they can derive the reaction just by the photosophon 1. And if photosophon 1 reduces flavoroxin, you still need the ATP. Yes. But this would be direct coupling of the electron transfer to the nanotonate, but in the PDB there is so far no structure of any thermal bacteria. Okay, Oliver, there's a, a new it's project. First, that's an important point. Now, one thing is that in heterocysts, uh, cyanobacteria don't have the photosystems active, but there no, is. The one PS1 is active, only PS2 is dead. Um, in principle, yes, but if you have the two heterocyst formation, they don't do this, but there are some species like Trichodesmium, which seems to be the, the predominant nitrogen fixer in marine environments, that actually drive this in the same cell. Um, but they basically use what's called the Mela reaction, which is a cyclic electron transfer back on photosystem one to get rid of oxygen that's evolved by, by the OEC to keep everything more or less anaerobic. Uh, and no, there is no structural data on that yet. Um, but it's an interesting system definitely, but the, the, the nitrogenases themselves are very similar to those and they're not expected to have any very unusual properties in terms of oxygen stability or so. And all the layers are the same. Um, that might relate actually, so I have a comment about sure. sulfide, but I put that, I put that second. Um, wonderful overview. I was just getting this idea because I, I wasn't thinking much about this half side reactivity except that I think you see this in quite a series of enzymes. Mm -hmm. But um, what we see when we look at the, the oxygen sensitivity of iron protein and MOFI protein, right, is that 
Obviously, iron protein is much more labile to oxygen than MOFI protein, mm -hmm. but actually, in the absence of any kind of catalysis and in vitro, iron protein is protected by the, the mere presence of MOFI protein. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the idea is, is it necessary that this complex between the two actually really dissociates? And when you form the complex, and when you see this in the structure, you get a symmetric complex. There mm -hmm. is actually a clamp of two phenylalanine residues that holds these things together. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine that the two last parts of your talk are actually connected, and that maybe you know, half of, of this enzyme is not just hanging around while the other one is working, but it's actually getting recharged, maybe without complete dissociation? Mm. You know, that, that right. one of the side effects of, of whatever power stroke action the iron protein has on one side pops off the, mm. the other iron protein on the other side. Yeah, that's a good question. Man. You know the literature like I do. Hoop Hawker suggested back in the 80s even that maybe it's early 90s, that you could get reduction you know, of the iron protein on complex. We've not been able to get data that's consistent with that. But you bring up a variation on that. Maybe the iron protein is still there, but not in the cocked mode. It's sort of to the, to the side. Relaxed. Yeah, relaxed a little bit. Halfway, yeah, the and, and then come back. That's certainly possible. We have no data. I don't, think, I don't think anybody had any data that would address that one way or the other. But that's an interesting idea. Maybe just a quick comment on the sulfur. Yes. Sulfur protonation. I mean, um, I wonder if we have to be so worried about where the protons actually go because um, there are a series of proton groups in the protein around. There is yes. possibly this conserved histidine that might mm -hmm. be just a proton source that keeps bubbling protons into the whole system. Right. Um, and your, your calculations also show that actually protonating that sulfide might actually labelize the sulfur yeah. iron bond and help it come off. It's a good question. We, we do know that it seems like protons aren't just randomly coming in. We know from, we changed the 195. Bill Newton did these studies, what, 20 years ago. If you change that 195 histidine, that you really do perturb the ability to reduce N2. So it looks like there's not just sufficient protons hanging around, if you take that at face value. That really is that histidine 185 that's there delivering those protons. So I think, I think it's not quite, you know, there is a water pool on the other side of homocitrate, but that is sort of sequestered and, you know, away from always, I always wonder about that because that water pool might well be ammonium. We can't distinguish that. Ah, so good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, a limitation of crystallography, right? So you can't distinguish between those. Well, you don't want to, yeah, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> he can't admit a limitation, but it maybe it's a limitation. <laughs> Yeah, good question. So, um, in the genome of, of the, these organisms, there's a D and K are the genes that code for the alpha and beta subunits. And so, what Dennis Dean has been able to do is he can duplicate that, so we can get those under this, their own promoters. So you can get a DK, DK. And then the trick that we're going to use is we have different uh, tags that you can put on those. So you can put a his tag on this side, you can put a strep tag on this side, yeah? And then, okay, now the light bulb went on, you see how this works, you pass it through the two columns, and what you'll isolate, you'll make all the different possibilities, and hopefully, if it works, you'll be able to isolate the hetero, the chimeric protein. That's what we're about, I'd say we're a few weeks away from having that construct com completed. We'll see if it works, it may not work. Pat. Hey, Pat. Great, great. I was going to ask, when you use flavodoxin to tune the protein over, do you see any spectroscopic differences in the metallo cofactors? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm thinking about all these new structure where the yeah. sulfur is missing and the possibility that maybe that sulfur is only ever there because of that thiodine. Sure. Yeah. For a long time, if there was anything from dithionate that would eventually get washed out, you would see a difference. Yeah, we reduced the flavodoxin with dithionate, so there still is dithionate there. So oh. we haven't done, <laughs> we haven't done the perfect experiment that's in the works, and so yeah, it, it should be doable to do that. Cool, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, Ted. Yeah. That it's chemically equivalent to the E2 state. There's no other way of looking at it. Uh -huh. So 
what what is actually preventing it from just being in a pit of despair and being a hydrogenase? And what's the incentive for actually accumulation of the E4 state? Because I, I just I don't get that. Because yeah. even though you guys call it reductive elimination, sure, it's still the same redox level. Yeah, absolutely right. And so, you know, it do, it does become just like E2 in the sense that if if N2 is not present, it will just relax just like E2, and you can make hydrogen. Um, presumably, there's something about this making bridging hydrides as opposed to terminal hydrides, which changes the reactivity of those hydrides. So again, hand wavy here, but you're right. I mean, E2 and E4 are equivalent in in at the level of the the metals, right? And so, yeah, we, it isn't it isn't totally clear. I mean, just the the insight you get from like the frustrated Lewis pair chemistry. Um, basically, you need to make a proton and a hydride. Mm -hmm. And you're set up beautifully for doing that. Okay, right. Very akin to all the hydrogenases. Yep. So it seems like there's just no incentive the way it's pulled, like plotted out for right. to ever Do. be combined. Sure. And as it's drawn, there is no in inhibition. That's right, and and but we know that we we well you can't make you can't do reductive elimination from the E2 state, right? So if we argue that you have to do reductive elimination, you have to release hydrogen from reductive elimination, activate the core by putting two more electrons in. Like presumably from going to the E4 and then vacating H2. Yep. In situ made E or from E4 in situ made E2. E2. Then binds right. E2. So yes. It still is. I would just say from a chemical perspective, pretty uh, uh, perplexing. Sure. How this could happen. I would agree. Absolutely. So I, I guess I yeah, wanted sure. to follow up yeah. on that. Um, so E2 and E4, I guess they're, di they're the same at the metal, yes. but they're not the same in hydrogen count. That's right. And I think, I don't know if you drew it, but there's probably a state in between E4 and the reductive el elimination mm -hmm. where N2 acts as a Lewis base mm -hmm. to coordinate. Right. Is that modeled in your Yes, yes, we show that. We show N2 has to bind before the H2 comes off. So that's, that's right. essentially what you're saying. So I guess the problem is how can the state with a, hydride or a hydrogen count for two higher right. be more reactive? That's Ted's the, question, yeah. right? Yeah. And, okay. We'll have to think more about that. Yeah. If not, we can continue this into the coffee break. Let's thank Lance again. Thank you.